In high school, we played a game. Many years later, we got back together to play one more. Little did we know, this time, the game was real. Join me, Aram Vartian, on Start Playing Games for a brand new type of fantasy role-playing. In Die RPG, you play a group of real-world, deeply flawed adults who are transported into a fantasy realm via a predatory, sinister role-playing game. The game transforms your characters into paragons and rewards them with strange and frightening powers. In Die RPG, you are confronted with your truest desires and deepest fears. And only you can decide when the game is over. Check out all of my available Start Playing Games campaigns at aram.gay. Hey people, this is Aram. Before we get started this week, I just want to give you guys a heads up. Talking about the Mind Flayer involves talking about slavery and mind control and sapient creatures as cattle. These are difficult topics. We're going to talk about them as carefully as we can and as sensitively as we can. But if any of this is too much, just skip it. Skip the interview. Skip the AP. Skip this episode altogether. We've got plenty of episodes that do not involve those topics. Go listen to one of those. Come back to this one when you feel comfortable. My name is Aram, and my pronouns are he, him. I'm the writer and producer of the Dungeon & Dragons podcast, God's Fall. My name's Dylan. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a physicist from Canada. Welcome to Kill, Kill Every, Every Monster. Monster. This week on Kill Every Monster, we are featuring the Mind Flare. Monster Manual describes Mind Flayers as the scourge of sentient creatures across countless worlds. Psionic tyrants, slavers, and interdimensional voyagers, they are insidious masterminds that harvest entire races for their own twisted ends. Four tentacles snake from their octopus-like heads, flexing in hungry anticipation when sentient creatures come near. We are joined by VJ Harris. VJ is a professional TTRPG book hoarder. Their friends have likened them to a dragon living in the Midwest. He is one of the authors of the platinum best-selling DM's Guide supplement, An Elf and an Orc Had a Little Baby, Volume 1, and one of the three designers of the original 5e compatible game, Those Who Wander. They can be found on Twitter and TikTok at VJH Creations. Welcome to the show, VJ. So happy to be here. I am a huge fan. <laughs> so we're going to get into the grand mess of things that comes up immediately. The moment you read the descriptive paragraph for Mind Flayers. It's almost as if they were like, okay, we compromised here and there, but we're not at all. This is something we love and we're not making any changes whatsoever. So before we get into all that mess, VJ, what's a Mind Flayer? Uh, the first thing, the first thing I'd, I'd say what a mind player is, is a uh, fun little tentacle monster that you can make little <laughs> slurpy, fun, uh, <laughs> tent tentacle noises <laughs> with when you play them. There are a number of monsters, I think, in D&D that kind of transcend any type of like humanoid value or I think a, a, a vampire can kind of be in there. But like for me, a mind player is that like one of those few alien beings that were um, to start themselves off with never quite human to begin with or humanoid. Unlike, you know, like I said, a vampire can be in that in that like kind of alien thing, but they were human or humanoid at one point. Unlike mind flayers, like in their origin. Sure, some mind flayers did start off as humanoid, but they're just that like that that alien unknowable kind of like. Cthulhu-esque creature that like is supposed to be operating in this like really fucked up space in the game. It's interesting with the mind of flares because I'm always tempted to allow them to retain some 
of who they were. But it's a big slug hollowing out the a brain. I mean, it just eats the brain and just lives in there and becomes the brain. It's almost like those weird tongue bugs on the fish, right? It just like <laughs> replaces the brain. So it's, it's a the different Yerks creature. It's and anamorphs, but worse and better at the same time. <laughs> So there's nothing left. It's just using the body to then incorporate and change and, you know, on a cellular fundamental level, convert for its needs. But I still like the idea of just like an echo in the flesh somehow, just just some echo of the former person and former personality that carries through just a little bit with them. Also, it's nice to make them different. Yeah, like I can't I I mean, I can't even argue with that because I, I know even in like for my settings, there's always the possibility of like bits and pieces of the consciousness of the previous person that the mind player was to be um, present or at the very least flashes of memories. Because like, I mean, which the mind player gets those anyway from eating, but some that linger around longer than they would with the standard mind player, like maybe in influencing how they react to things and whatnot. Aram, you mentioned like the idea of something lingering in the flesh, but I think that's the harder one to explain because this is straight psychic magic. You consumed another person person's consciousness like that isn't a meat problem. That's a you have all of their thoughts and memories in their brain and then in your brain now. And then it's a question of just how those manifest. How well can you bury those? This is the other part of it. Is it like Rogue from the X-Men where the whole personality is in there and can take over should some psychic damage happen to you or you just mentally falter or they just trick you like... You know, they regain control of the body. Is it like that or is it like a well that they can just dip into and extract knowledge from? Almost as if they're putting on the clothing of that person, wearing their memories and accessing them that way. I think closer to the latter personally, but VJ, what do you think? Raw, I got to agree that it's probably closer to the latter. Me personally, if I'm running them, it's it's either or. When a mind flare eats another humanoid's brain, that just adds another person in there. Like, it's just pile them on up. One more in the well. See, I'm inclined to do a little bit of both. Most of the time, they're just going to overwhelm these minds. They're far superior, far stronger. Those all go in the well. But the really strong ones, they get to hang outside. The well. They're the coins, I suppose. What if we're going to use this analogy? But they're the ones that don't go in the well, right? Because they're told there's only like a couple of those outside of it. So that's sort of where I was sitting, except that I don't think I don't think of it even as a well. I think of it as like when you consume the minds, it's almost like reading a book, you know? It's not that that person lingers in any material way. It's that those experiences and those memories, you have them now. Like, you ever watch too much of a show in one sitting? Like, the example I have to go to, because it's happened to me lately, is I sat down and I watched 10 seasons of Letter Kenny in a good hard run over the course of, like, a couple of days. Wow. I get very bored. And I came out 45% 45 more Canadian for several days. (laughs) (laughs) Because that was just... You spend so much time with the characters. You hear the voices so much. You start picking up a little bit more accent. I start like my idioms started going just a wee touch more country. It it got in my head. And I think like when you have those powerful, what you're thinking of as powerful brains, like in a psychic sense, are generally also going to be people who have more extreme, more robust experiences and memories that are going to imprint on you harder. You eat the baker from town. What's the most intense emotion that they've ever felt? What's the biggest the thought? The most made world- the- Yeah. Things that are still fantastic for, you know, living a given life. But then you get the 20th level wizard who had to murder a devil to get the components for a spell that they had been working on for a quarter century. That ain't going away easy. Okay, so if you eat the person, you read them like a book, but you've read them like a book once, and you remember whatever you remember 
as if you experienced the person like a book. If you choose not to fully put them into oblivion, you risk them taking over, but you can talk to them and access those memories over and over again as if the person was there. That's a world building choice. Because that ain't a thing that exists in the book. That's just you saying words. Yeah, I'm I not re- saying they're bad words, <laughs> you're but you're making right. shit up. <laughs> I'm way, way off book at this point. You're completely right. PJ, what draws you to mind flayers? Like, what makes them so fascinating to you? Well, the first thing, which I've already done, is a little, oh, with my fingers and tongue. I love making yeah, that sound. Uh, <laughs> like, that is super cool. I even have a mask, a mind flayer mask now, that, like, I can don't even have to do the fingers feel through the sound inside of it, and it's great. That's perfect, because you want it kind of <laughs> filtered and weird like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, exactly, it's great. <laughs> Let's be real here. Besides being slavers, they're the eugenesis of the D&D space. Like, they take their little, uh, yeah, they take the little larva, and they put it into a variety of humanoids and other creatures and see what it turns out, which is how we get things like the... Like the... No idea how, the, like, the first Mind Flayers were created. Like, uh, canonically, anybody that's listened to the Aboleth episode has also heard about Mind Flayers as they are attached to Aboleth and the long memory. And so there's no one besides maybe some really old elder brains that can answer that question, and we just don't have those answers. What came first, the tadpole or the squid? We just don't know. So what happens is you get an elder brain, and they have a brine pool beneath them. And inside the brine pool, uh, like, um, these little like little worms uh, mature and grow and only the best of the best are picked out of that. And then those little uh, larvae are implanted into a variety of creatures. Now to repopulate, it is typically, I think it's um, humans, half elves and dwarves and maybe orcs um, that are used to like, that are that have the little larva put next to their eye, which it goes in up their eye socket into their head and begins the ceramorphosis process, which begins turning you into a mind flare. Um, but when it comes to like any other like humanoid besides the one I mentioned and other creatures, so think um, think mind flares, think dragons, think purple worms, maybe in there too. Um, ropers, like in previous editions, I don't think we have like any mind flare ropers uh, for 5e, but I know they existed in previous editions and whatnot. Amazing though. It's terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> I hate that. You get, you get the, you get them turning into these like really weird things. So you have like the gnome just dragging you across the floor towards them. Just, <laughs> I, I really, actually I'll, I'll mention that. I'll mention that later. Um, you get like, um, so you get a lot of, you get a lot of weird things like the gnome ceramorph. You get, um, the mind witness, you get, um, God, the mind witness is a yeah, beholder. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, you can get the elder brain dragon, which was new in like fizz bands. Um, and then there's also like this one other thing that happens if a uh, brine pool is left on its own, either because the, because usually what that means is that everybody's been killed, but the people that killed the whole mind flayer high plus the elder brain didn't think to get rid of the, the brine pool. All of them eat each other and then they grow into, into like a neolithid, which is a big problem for any mind flayer colonies outside of where they actually are very dangerous so that's like that's how mind flayers come to bleed and for anybody that like doesn't know what they look like or hasn't seen the picture like seriously think cthulhu face tentacle individuals like humanoid bodies for the rest of it pretty much yeah it's horrifying all of it's horrifying every version of this thing is horrifying you get that standard like brain expansion effect where your head gets a little bit bigger. You get the tentacles coming out in place of your mouth. The hair goes away because, of course, it does. You're a squid. Squids don't have hair. That'd be silly. Aram, do you have any experience with Animorphs as a as a property? No, I was way too old. I mean, I know what it is. I've seen the covers. I've seen the memes, but I nothing. Yeah. The villain in Animorphs was... I can't decide if it's better or worse than Mind Flayers, but it's the same sort of vein of villain in that it is a parasitic species called the Yerks that live in a brine pool, basically. And 
when they take a host, it's basically someone else in a host grabs someone, drags them to the edge of the pool, forces their ear down to touch the water. And out of the brine, a slug will swim up and climb down the ear canal. And instead of consuming the brain and completely destroying the host, it basically flattens itself over the brain and seizes control. So it's oh. those are the two ends of basically the same thing where it's complete complete consumption and replacement right. you are now a different creature you are the illithid you are a mind flayer now and that is what you are or this slug riding you like a fucking car for three days and it goes back in the pool and you're put back in the pantry to wait until it's ready to get back in again it's you know it's a hard call to think which is worse clearly you're aware the whole time with option two you just have zero control you're just seeing things go like you're in a puppet it's that's really, really bad. bad but also there's a chance to get out there's a chance the brain slug can be killed or ejected or whatever and you can be you again because your brain's still there mm-hmm. maybe have a little hole in your head but you're still good to go but i think i'd, I I'd want to live and try and fight i, I yeah. don't know <laughs> ask, ask me after a couple of years <laughs> i might change my mind I'm, I'm going to be honest. I, I think I'd rather just be gone. I like when like when we like talk about zombie apocalypse and stuff, I'm like, look, I just want to get got immediately. I don't want to sur- have to survive through any of this. Like, listen, if it's going to happen, just take me out immediately. I was a guest on a total party thrill where we talked about uh, gaming with chronic illness. And one of the things we talked about is like before you have a chronic illness, you usually have a zombie survival a plan and then you get a chronic illness and then the zombie survival plan is like just goes right out the window because there's just no way my hands won't work i won't be able to you know my thyroid will go out of control like i am the jump scare okay when you see me in the when you see me in the zombie show it's gonna be three episodes in when they have to go to like a walgreens to get sub to get supplies and i jump out of the closet and then they have to shoot me in the head that's it (laughs) that's where you're gonna see me (laughs) i used to have a plan to get to the hoover dam because it'll run for seven years without if there's no human intervention whatsoever the Hoover Dam will operate and produce electricity for seven years. And that's if no maintenance is done whatsoever. So that was the plan. That's fair. (laughs) There wasn't much beyond that. Just get to the Hoover Dam. This is going to be the worst thing I've ever said to get us back on track. But anyway, so VJ, uh, eugenics. (laughs) Yes, eugenics and uh, by extension slavery. Yeah. Anybody that knows me has listened to me talk about bigotry and like D&D as a game and the space know that my stance is, hey, don't put racism, sexism, queer phobia, all of that into your games. You don't need it to make villains. You don't need it to have fun. And it's you're more than likely just going to do something really fucked up with it. As such, I've like when world building, I'm like, OK, drought don't have slaves <laughs> like I don't want to I don't want to deal with that. Do they take people for human sacrifices? Sure. Fine. Have at it. But they don't keep slaves like the only only exceptions I've ever made to that rule are vampires and mind flayers. Yes. When it's cattle, when it's actual cattle of people, they're just consuming them as animals. Yeah. Like Let's be clear here. It's still not good. Not good. And also, like, I'm never going to put my players, if I'm running um, vampires or mind flayers, I'm never going to put my players in a position where either they're going to be, like, permanent thralls. Like, maybe they go they they go under and the enthrall spell or whatever, like, you know, the charm person for vampires. But it doesn't last forever unless the player is like i want to specifically explore this how can we work with it have really discussed it really done the research for it and and at the end i'm like okay i feel comfortable that i can handle this appropriately my my one saving thing is if i feel like i can handle it appropriately because nine times out it's like so far 10 times out of 10 it's been like um i did the research i don't think i can do this um so i haven't actually had to navigate that a lot i haven't had to navigate that at all um but as far as like keeping people to eat them, um, that I'm like, okay, 
you do literally have to eat people. Um, like if I run, if I run vampires and mind flayers, but mind flayers specifically rules as written, they do need to eat people uh, to survive. There is some lore somewhere out there. Maybe it's a previous edition where, or maybe it might be this edition where they can just eat um, their intellect devourers, the little brains with the four legs, that little dog brains. And like, there's no rule. I don't understand how that those are reproduced, but I, right. I mean, I'm, my understanding is like, if you get enough of them, you can just keep reproducing them. And they, there's no like clear rules that they have to eat anything. Like obviously they can eat stuff like brains, but they don't have to. So technically speaking, if you had like a, let's say uh vegetarian mind flayers, uh, they could just, you know, make a bunch of intellective hours and just feed off of that, right? Um, but yeah, it's kind of vegetarian, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but like, um, and it would still require creating them, which I do believe requires like the brains of some thralls and stuff. For five e at least, it says they subsist on the brains of humanoids. The brain provide enzymes, hormones, and psychic energy necessary for survival. So I think we're in that territory where it's like, how often do they need to eat? It doesn't say how often. Uh, it does say that, you know, if they're healthy from a brain-rich diet, implying that a brain-poor diet would make them unhealthy. We'll get to the next paragraph there because I think that's actually fascinating and fantastic fodder for games. The combination of calling out the material of it, like, no, 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 you have to eat it for nutritional value, but also there's a psychic element to it, is like... Yeah. Now we've ruled out there's a high the clone spell or something like that. Like you take a high level wizard, they clone themselves and you eat the brain of the clone. Well, that's empty calories. You just ate French fries. Brain celery. OK, but would like a, a retooled like awaken like like awaken mind spell fix that then? Like if you took the like if you took the clone spell and the clone spell creates a new human body. So and then if you cast Awaken, I would argue even casting Awaken on like a fucking dog or something would probably it puts it up to human level cognition, which would imply sufficient psychic energy. You could maybe make a case for like the nutritional uh, <laughs> benefits of dog versus man. Yeah. But like, honestly, let me tell you, though. It's no more horrifying to think of an elithid casting awaken on a dog every time they're hungry yeah. and the dog being like, oh, we can finally. Again, if anything, maybe a touch worse. Yes, absolutely. Because <laughs> the dog will trust them. If I if I had to eat and it was between like, let's say Aram, you and I were stranded somewhere and I had my dog Nick with me. Yeah, you're going to pick me. First of all, there's more of me logically. I might than the dog. If I knew that we could survive, if we would get, if you were still alive, and I was like, okay, we just need to survive for until we can get something oh, else. I'd yeah. be like, yeah, I love my dog, but I, I don't value him more than the human lives of my friends. I do appreciate that. So I'm not saying that the dog is worse on moral grounds because it's a dog. I'm saying the act of casting a spell to create sentience and then to immediately have the sole experience mm. of a sentient, <laughs> fully formed mind be the complete terror of its own consumption. That's more fucked mm. to me. You know... It can't be satisfying because there's not because it talks about eating the memories and the experiences. And if they haven't really had any, then that is a again, it's like popcorn. That would I mean, it might keep you alive, but not for long, I'd imagine. Like the more satisfying a meal, the longer it lasts. Mm -hmm. This is where I'm going to contradict you again. Because I don't know that it'd be worse nutritionally, because what it says there is an illithid experience that experiences euphoria as it devours the brain of the human humanoid along with its memories personality and innermost fears so it's not necessarily that it's better for them they're getting high on it it's survival at that point you're eating rice cakes yeah. just to live so you live but it's m misery in comparison on the note of note of like food consumption again it's not 5e it's from the 3.5 book uh lords of madness just this little one little quick paragraph um a mind flare must have a minimum of one fresh brain per month any less than that and it suffers physical debilitation becoming so weak that it could die its ideal diet 
is one brain per week. A mind player that consumes one brain a week does not feel deprived. It can eat more than that for enjoyment and for the psychic boost, and it will if brains are plentiful. Typically, mind players consume somewhere between the minimum of one brain per month and the ideal of one brain per week, averaging one brain every two weeks and supplementing their diet with other foods. Yeah, that's a lot of brains. That is 52 brains per year. If they're eating well. There are a few times where you should really consider agriculture in your games. There's no society that has, a, that has become a society without having a few people farm a lot of food. A single mind flayer requires, on average, about 26, let's say, adult humans per year. If the society is in a near... Not starvation mode, but if they're getting half of their nutrients, that's true. If they their nutrient need is one a week. 50 people a year need to die. Let's assume that it's uh, it's got to be an adult brain just for not making it as horrifying as it could be. But that means that you need 20 years per person. And you right. need 50 of them every year. Like that, the farm doesn't work anymore. And they need to have a society because they need to have experiences because that's what you want to consume. They have to create art and go on dates and build houses and lay down roads. Well, you don't have to, but this is like making Wagyu, uh, Wagyu brain, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, the humans got to get massages. <laughs> We feed them nice food, and then the brain's going to be the tastiest. But you could also just have a bunch of people sitting in pens. You'd get by. It's this stuff right here, why mind players are like my one of my one of two ex ex exceptions for thralls, on uh, like slaves, for slaves and everything, because it's physiologically, they do need a variety of things for them to exist. Like, that is just a fact. And sure, I could say, oh, really? They could actually just be leeching off the psychic energy and not killing people and don't have to keep thralls. But, and and yeah, I could do that. But I also like the horror of what they're doing. And I feel comfortable doing that in a, in a way that I'm not also subjecting my player to being a part of that because I like, like, there's, there is a place for this kind of alien behavior. Yeah, when it becomes a story of the alienness of them versus our humanity, and we're using that story to highlight the differences, that's where this becomes actually usable and good for the story. I run pro games and like I say no, like I'll say no slavery, no racism, no sexism, n nothing like that in my games. And um, but if I'm like, hey, we're playing in a world where mind flayers and vampires exist and they do keep slaves, they do keep them for breeding purposes for use as like frontline fodder like uh they do experiment on people i make that very clear up front and like mm -hmm. this does exist in the world it doesn't have to be something we explore or look at but it is there yeah we don't have to go there but it's there if you decide to go there i i guess it, it really boils down to um every other instance besides mind flayers and vampires and and i'm probably forgetting some other monsters that literally have to eat humanoids and cultivate them to survive um but any like any monster that fits within that niche the way the vampire and the mind flare does i think is the one exception to having slavery-esque behavior in there but then again also like uh let's let's not turn it into like race like slavery based on like any anybody's race it's slavery based on edibility Exactly. And one of the tweaks I do make is like, oh, mind flayers can be created from any type of like uh, humanoid. You, they can eat any type yeah. of humanoid brain. It's not like they're singling out dwarves, humans, half orcs and elves and elves, be dwarf humans, orcs and elves because they are those races. I'm like, I yeah, I can't get into that. Mm -hmm. I do like limiting it to sapient humanoids with exceptions for like a crazy experiment that worked and you made like, uh, you know, a litcher, whatever, like, like those are the freak ones. Like those are not the normal ones. Those are the mutants. But I do like restricting it to the humanoids. That actually, that gives it at least a bit of like, you know, glue, I guess, I to hold it together. Not necessarily humanoids, but sufficiently intelligent brains. Because typically once you hit humanoid level intelligence, you're getting to scary fucking critters. 
But yeah, you could, in theory, make yeah, a here's dragon into a mind flayer. Now hold a dragon down long enough. Make it work. They would have. And that's the problem. Any In the thousands of years they've been around. Th- oh, yeah. In the thousands of years they would have. But like that's one. Yeah. If they could become dragons, if they could evolve, they would have. This is where they can be. If they found a more now humanoids, right? I would say that counts for giants. I would argue it doesn't count for giants, but giants as creatures can be turned into some type of like um, illithid experimentation. Like, um, could you still eat them? Yes. You know what? I think they can eat any. Any smart brain. Any smart brain, but not any smart brain can be turned into an illithid. Gotcha. OK, that makes sense. Here's yeah. my, my little bit of science that I'm going to pitch. Your thing is you have to consume like you have to consume enough to get big enough to take over the head, right? How long does it take a slug to eat a giant brain? Long time. Because that's going to go off before you're big enough to have illithid eyes did the head. No, I see what you're I see what you're saying. There are there are tolerances built into this system. Yeah. Which is where that experimentation thing comes in. It's like now not only do you have to get the slug onto the dragon, hold the dragon down long enough for it to start eating, but now you also have to keep once the once the dragon is dead, you've now definitely killed it. You have to stop the brain from rotting for long enough for this slug to consume the brain and get that big. Or you also science a really big slug. They have those. They're called neolithids. Oh, right. It's also really bad. bad. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We don't Mm -hmm. don't want that. We don't want it to be a dragon either. That's not stellar. I completely agree. These are all terrible ideas. No one should do them. But if you've got a society of brain eating fetish clad monster scientists, one of them's going to do something truly diabolical and stupid at some point. I'm also realizing maybe a dragon illithid is a bad call because those tentacles are real floppy. And if it tried to breathe fire, it'd hurt its face. They go out like a like a starfish. They open up. It's got to yell first and then they go. (laughs) The fizz band like elder brain dragon does like like spew doesn't have that breath weapon anymore. It spews out the larva that like can turn you into mind flayers. That's bad. Yeah. Yeah. It can turn you in a short amount of time compared to the regular seromorphosis process, which takes about a week. And if nothing else, everyone's got to spend around get the things off them, if nothing else, right? Or casting spells that will get rid of them because that is, oh my God, it's, it's not even a breath weapon anymore. That is vomiting a stream of slugs and mucus <laughs> at you. So this is a thing that comes up with dragons frequently, but in, but in this case, it's so much worse. Imagine mind flayers laying siege to a city, not even putting a huge amount of effort in, just the sort of thing like force people back, make them put the walls up, make them shut the gates. And then you take an hour or two and you just strafe that fucking city or go to the water supply or go to the edge of the sewers. I mean, if you want to do I mean, it, if you go to the so edge of the ways. sewer and you do it, that is good for like a slower burn, like insidious campaign like these are starting to show up that's your green dragon white dragon yeah. kind of mode right red dragons are going to fly over all dramatic and just strafe it well, that's the thing for me it's like you're you're going to start implying shit early on in the campaign about a dragon disappearing about these experiments going on and then that's the big like end of second act holy shit we're fucked we need to end this is when the entire city is just strafed by this disgusting purple tentacle dragon that just turns a city. That is the worst version of this I've heard, frankly. (laughs) That's very similar to that creature in Chult where they had the zombie T-Rex eating the zombies. So there were just zombies, you know, half alive and half chewed and (laughs) falling out of its mouth. All the, yeah, that's that Mm -hmm. level of horror. But it's good. And, uh, And look, it'd be smart. So yeah. it would lay siege like that. It would use tactics like that. It, 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 it is the good. worst. It, they just shouldn't make it. No. And if one of them makes it, there's got to be like, they never really talk about it, but there's got to be some high court, right? There's got to be some method of like controlling and punishing the population when they step out of line. Okay. So we already know factually in the lore that any mind flayer that has like 
um, arcane capabilities, gets hunted down or gets uh, uh, has to flee, gets hunted down, gets killed by their brethren on the like command of the elder brain. So the ones who are practicing magic might as well go ahead and do crazy experiments anyway. Yeah, they might as well do whatever the, the they might as well do whatever the fuck they want. Like even as far as becoming like a lich, essentially, like you're already screwed. Like if you can do magic, they're like. I believe the word is Alhoon in this case. Okay, so the Alhoon, I think, is the magic user. And then there's the Illithilich, I think is how you pronounce that. It's got so many I's and L's in this. I I hate it. Illithilich. Yeah, Illithilich. Yeah. No, Alhoon were magic using outcasts from Mind Flayer societies who had defied the ruling elder elder brains to achieve a limited form of lichdom. Oh, the litho liches are the next step up of like, gotcha. I'm not going to bother reading a full article right now, but like, yeah. And Alhoon were always limited form liches. The litho lich is just like, we've done the full. We figured out a way to make psionics and arcane magic do a little kiss. And then there is the mind flare arcanist. OK, OK, yep. Mind flares are like Porsches. They come in a bunch of different models and shapes even though they all look exactly the same and no one understands the difference and all their abilities seem to overlap. There's the undead ones that are actually a problem. And then there's the Mind Flayer Arcanists, which don't inherently get kicked out if they're still following the Elder Brain. But I can, like, I know historically there's very few Elder Brains and colonies for a variety of reasons. Maybe they're, like... A lot, the, the main reason, because they're being hunted down by the uh, Gith, the Githyanki and the Githsarai. I know it's not 5e, but previous lore, there are definitely occasions where elder brains have communicated with each other. But I don't know if there's like, like canon to any previous editions that there was like a council of like, you know, like all the remaining elder brains that could somehow link up and discuss with each other. I'm going to push that maybe that. They don't talk like they can talk. They've probably made contact and had to like push back. But we're looking at like if you look at this as like an ecology problem, they're the apex predator. Inherently, they have to have a much lower population than whatever their prey beast is, which is us. Right. So if you were ever close enough to another elder brain to make contact, you're fucked. Your food source is going to die. I, I would actually argue, depending on where the mind flayers are and, and like the standard being roughly 300 people and they need 50 people to go, they could like, for example, um, what you call it? Uh, the Forgotten Realms, the, appro- the approximate like there is approximately uh, like 1,300, no, 130,000 people in Waterdeep. On its own, not in just the city. No, not even the like surrounding areas. So like, obviously, if 30, if 30,000 people went missing, something would go like they, they would get found out. Like there is arguments to say, oh, we spread out so that we also don't get found out. But along the like eating population thing could be mind flayers that are like closer mind flayer colonies that are closer to each other where the um, elder brains could communicate uh, depending on the population size. But also, like I said, there's the whole like, but for safety, would they be that close? So we've spent a lot of time talking about, you know, farming sapient creatures and creating an artificial religion in which human <laughs> sacrifices are mandated to maintain a utopia. And, you know, <laughs> horrifying eugenic slave experimentation. All bad, by the way. So not not to ask a leading question or anything. Uh, hey, VJ, are Mind Flayers monsters? 100%. One, like, you know what? I'll say 99%. Uh, and the only reason I'm going to say 99% is simply because I've said this recently, like, uh, when I was talking about, like, all evil race, and somebody was like, well, why are you fine with Mind Flayers? I was like, well, one, they typically have to eat people, which, as we've already mentioned, they could eat um, uh, intellect of hours after they've created the initial ones, right? And then two, most mind flayers are under the influence, not like total domination, but influence of a literal evil entity. Um, so like, I can't, I find them, I find it horrific, but I can't blame them for it behaving in that way under the influence of like an evil 
aberration that is then like having the others around them be evil and that just keeps going and going and going but if a mind flayer were to like break away and got past that evilness like some of them don't obviously we have the liches we have the undead um which i mean being undead doesn't automatically make you evil in a sense depending on how you got there um so like i say the one percent because in like in 5e lore like lore wise you could technically have a bunch of quote-unquote vegetarian illithids that are not under the control of a um elder brain that are just living their lives and you know just existing as people but other than that yeah 99 percent, totally 100 percent monsters no question about it yeah a little illithid commune somewhere yeah yeah Yeah. they're they're fucking horrifying yeah 100 percent We sort of talked about it in the vampire episode, the idea that like when you are a young vampire and it's like the thing you sort of have to do, like it's a biology problem, right? Right. Like you are a species that consumes brains that's inherent to your species. It's very hard to call that evil. That's that's biology. Lions aren't evil. Right. The eugenics and slavery part and the fact that that's heavily ingrained in their society, that part is really uh sort of canceling out the biology argument with vampires they were people before so they know better and they have a choice with mind flayers their society existed for thousands of years with total absolute control over everything there's no other ideas for them there's no concept of rebellion there's no idea of balance or maybe some of them have like thought this but for the most part it's a pretty homogenous just stable society that doesn't yeah. change it just gets more advanced so this concept might not even have like entered their minds i'm not saying that's an excuse i'm just saying that it's they're so alien it's hard to think along those lines i kind of feel like that I could get, I can get by, behind that argument up to the point where the Gith um, rebelled against them and then started hunting them down for their atrocities. Right. I am going to say a thing real quick. I like what popped into my head are like you know like Confederate slave owners who think like oh my slaves like being slaves and this and that and blah 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 and then there's a slave rebellion and it's like. If they survive, it's like, if you went through that, why wouldn't you stop and think about if, if Yeah. It's wild right. to say, oh, we never thought about it like that. I'm like, okay, sure, sure. Let's say I, be- let's say I give you the benefit of the, yeah. Let's say I give you the benefit of the doubt that there was no reason for you to think about this. No, like no reason to think about the humanity of the people you were dealing with. But after they rebelled and, you know, killed some people, did some things to rightfully get away from you um yeah how are you not thinking about it now like if you go back to doing that same behavior how are you not how can you like say well we it was it didn't even cross your mind well you were just violently rightfully violently attacked and usurped from your position so yeah yeah where's the thought process in this like in the aftermath in the decline of their species and even if you're looking at them as like cattle initially like the first time you see two humans fall in love you can hear, you can understand what they're saying. You know what they're doing. You know, like you would just shift. Like we personify our cats and our dogs. Imagine how much you would, for lack of a better term, personify people. Especially when you're eating their brains and tasting their memories. Feeling all of their pain and their deepest fears every time you approached. Like, honestly, just remembering the part that they eat them afterwards and get those memories. It's like that that argument can't even hold water then because you have intimate knowledge of their feelings and lives and existences. So it's like. But if you believe you're a god. You're raised to believe you're a god. And the people you're eating believe that they will live in God forever. By being eaten. Like, if that's your whole society, if it's so effed up, I mean, I just don't know. I don't know. I, it, it's so, it, there's so many layers to it. You can, you mm-hmm, can just keep mm-hmm. piling on arguments yeah. on either side. It is, but you're right. This makes it a uniquely fascinating a creature, which I think gives us a little bit of room as long as everyone's on board and we, you really trust the table you're at to dive into some of these topics. It's the place where we are going to chase our tails till the end of days. Is mind flayers are sort of inherently monstrous. 
an inherently like a fantastic symbol of colonization and a a self-decreed higher power coming over deciding your lives are not as valuable as theirs and living their life on your wreckage but also now say the phrase so they all deserve to die mm, mm. <laughs> i hate it i hate it, it makes my mouth itch well they're monsters okay and so are people so, who, is, everyone. so is everyone really Every, they're monsters we're monsters everyone are monsters. everything is bad everything no is... one's having fun anymore <laughs> welcome to the show pj <laughs> please join our patreon where we'll make you sad again <laughs> okay. mechanically well lore as well how would you change 5th edition's Mind Flayers? Okay, so a couple things. One, I think I've already mentioned, like I've already mentioned in my setting, like any humanoid can be turned into a Mind Flayer. And I really think that 5e should lean into that, but also lean into it more with like more like variations. So for example, um, if a Mind Flayer took a gemstone dragonborn and turned them into a gemstone dragonborn illithid or whatever the name would be now they're still an illithid but they have additional powers like we know that the gemstone dragonborns have like some of them have psionic abilities or all of them have psionic abilities and maybe they are used as like an amplifier like i know there's a specific distance that the mind that the elder brain can communicate with mind flares before they're like out of that i'm like what if the gemstone dragonborn illithid acts as an amplifier and as long as you're within x amount of feet or whatever you can still they can dream across space so you put one on each planet, and now you're creating a network. The illithid relays. Exactly. Like, something like that. That would be so cool. And then here's the other thing. It never made sense to me <laughs> why Mind Flayers would use their tadpoles on non on their larva, on non-humanoid creatures, given it's used to propagate their dying species. I'm like, right. this, right? It's like, th like and, and, it, and it's the thing where, like, they only use the strongest of them. It's not like they're, like, also using the weak ones. So I'm like, I think there should be, like, a variation, uh, like, a, like, like, the... If we think of mind flayers as aliens, I think like you know as like like we have a we have a bunch of races in Five E, but as a completely separate species from anything related to the ones like the the actual Five E races, they would they would have they would probably eventually after however many years this is happening evolve to deal with the fact that their species is dying, and I think that there should now be like a mind flayer um like maybe you call it a mind flayer experimenter where they actually like secrete tadpoles that are only good for putting into non-humanoid creatures so that way there it makes it makes consistent sense because if i was in charge i'm like you're not making in um okay i would make a i would make an elder brain dragon i would totally do that because they spew out more but a mind witness a roper absolutely fucking not don't you use my my larva for that bullshit As a podcast network, our first priority has always been audio and the stories we're able to share with you. But we also sell merch, and organizing that was made both possible and easy with Shopify. <coughs> Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell and grow at every stage of your business, from the launch your online shop stage all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. They have an all-in-one e-commerce platform and in-person POS system, so wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. With the internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms, Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers. Shopify has allowed us to share something tangible with the podcast community we've built here, selling our beanies, sweatshirts, and mugs to fans of our shows without taking up too much time from all the other work we do to bring you even more great content. And it's not just us. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Shopify is also the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Because businesses that grow grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm, all lowercase. 
Go to shopify.com slash R-E-A-L-M now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash realm. Aram, why are you here? That's not the question. The question is, why am I? Because anywhere I am, any place, any plane, any time, any location, any city, anywhere, I am there for the exact same reason, to hunt down and kill mind flayers. Do you do this alone? I don't. I will team up with people. I will, I am not the kind who's too arrogant or like whatever gets the job done, I do. But for the most part, I work alone. This time you had teammates as generous. Guides, locals, someone who knew a story, someone who knew a place, people who could lead you. And you came, you came to a place that you do not long you approached there was you cased the entire building watching carefully looking for signs of motion signs of life signs you intended to fully snuff out shortly after entering the world went blank There is a brief moment, which could have been seconds or hours or days later, where you're, you open your eyes slightly at the sound of a scream far, a little far off in the distance, still in the same area of where you had these guides take you, and you recognize it. One of the guides, uh, a younger elvish woman, leading you into this place, helping you with your tasks, seeking glory or compensation, whatever was promised to her. You could hear very clear the pitch of her scream and know it's her. How many times have I heard the scream of someone being eaten by a mind flare. How many mind flares have you killed? In a decade, maybe half a dozen. I'm pretty good at what I do. You've probably heard this less than 10, maybe four or five times in your life. But it's distinctive. Oh God, yes. Mind flares consume their prey alive and they consume their prey, typically, from behind. And there's a point in the scream where they lose control of their body, of their voice, of their ability to keep that consistent sound, and it, it cuts. <laughs> that moment lives with you. So I know instantly where I am. Yes. What is around me? darkness again. You fade in and out. Your other guide was a, uh, a dark-skinned dwarf. Good man. Seemed well-liked by the people around, but he knew things that people were always a little bit uncomfortable with him talking about. You hear... not even hear something. The words are just unbidden in your mind as you kind of lull your head to one side and realize you're on a bed now, and you see the stretcher next to you, and you see these purple fingers just dancing along the forehead, and just those mumbled thought words of, doesn't it? Doesn't typically work. Could go all right this time. We'll see. And then you feel a tension shift over to you, 
and it's almost like you've been punched in the head and the world goes dark again. BJ, tell Aram about the room he wakes up in when he finally fully regains consciousness. The wall is completely made out of stone, not like solid stone, but uh, the kind of cobbled pathway stone, like the way you place bricks, but in that old timey way, not like the modern way or anything. And looking around, you're still laying on this bed, Um, but you see two other beds as well in there. Um, t- small, like, m- m- small wooden tables next to them with uh, strange instruments. And looking to your right immediately, you see those instruments are covered in some dark, probably dried liquid at this point, which you can imagine what that is. You um, also see off in a corner, a figure slumped forward just enough, far enough for you to see as if like there's part of something has like burst out from their skull the flesh and like the headbursters ex- yeah exactly like you can just see that and then to your left just leaning up slightly you see another your third companion a um young half orc ready to come and fight alongside you to claim victory and legendary status and destroying the creature you were hunting um, appears to be awake and the only only strange thing you could see at this point is a um, cloth covering that like starts at the eyebrows and covers the full full head okay that's upsetting that's all very upsetting <laughs> am I bound no no You were never intended to wake up. Right. This sort of arrogance. Typical. Harna is very well trained. And she would want to get up, want to react, want to investigate. Just every fiber in her being is screaming at her to take action. But she won't. She's patient. If she's not bound, they did not expect her to get up. So she will lay there control her breathing and she will cast detect thoughts to try and see if anyone else is alive. You pick up thoughts coming from the half-orc. They are not complex. They're not deep enough. They are not humanoid thoughts. Any thoughts left? Stone walls. Probably not immediately out in the hallway. Maybe a room or two away, maximum or at minimum. Yeah, I opened up my GIF sensors. <laughs> yeah. yeah, double yeah. tapped on a temple, and the fucking antennas came out. I will. I can keep it active for a minute. Yeah. So I will open my eyes and look around. This is the first time you're looking fully conscious, eyes open. And one of the first things you notice is that towel, the cloth, whatever, the covering on the half orc. Very occasionally, their eyes flutter a little and the cloth stirs. Otherwise, you are in a medical bay. They're surgical tools, but like seems like they're just handy this isn't there's not quite enough room to move around maybe for prep work out of curiosity and because gathering knowledge about these things is always helpful as an executioner of them walk over to this half orc and in one hand I'm forming this milky white blade that kind of vibrates with psionic energy. And with the other hand, and just like holding this blade like right up to the back of its head, I'm gonna remove the cloth. I don't know if you've ever seen it before, but when you see the hole, and when you see the wet skin moving inside the skull, 
you can put it together. Can I see the little creature? Can I see the slug? Little, in this case, may feel like a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, it turns out if you put something like fist size inside of a skull, like, yeah, you, yeah, relative to you, it's small, but relative to the hole it's in, it ain't. I'm going to dig that little bastard out. Oh, Jesus Christ. Give me a medicine check. <laughs> okay, I will give you a medicine check. 10 plus 4 is 14. Give me a dexterity save. My dexterity save is 17 plus 7 is 24. Fantastic. It does not bite you on the way out. It Angry bites. badger. <laughs> Angry wet slug badger. I would say tooth and nail, but like doesn't have nails. So tooth and tooth. No, it's got one of those a spitty mouths, right? A lamprey mouth. Uh, covered in brain tissue. Gross. That orc, they were sitting bolt upright, looked awake the entire time, stared you down as you looked around the room. And the moment you pull this thing out, all the muscles go slack. 100% dead. It was sitting up on the bed, so it just falls over backwards and just flops onto the ground. All right, is there a jar? Yep, of course. Good. Put him in the jar. You have one jar of larval mind flayer. You and I are going to have a talk. And I put him in a bag or whatever, <laughs> summon my sword, and I start to figure out where the hell I am. Walk up to the door and listen. BJ, where do you think you're at? I'm going to be the thing in the background. I will say I'm not within 30 feet if the t if the tech thoughts is still up. Yeah, I, I feel like I, I think I, I could have maintained my concentration while digging out a brain sucker. Oh, no, it probably would have taken a minute. So that's done by now. So I'm just listening at the door. Yeah, you don't hear anything. BJ, you want to tell us a little bit about the place you made your home? Tried to be inconspicuous. I, uh needed some place to work, some place that I could easily grab others, bring them back here, but also that people wouldn't think it was off if um, I wasn't, if, if they came up to it, they, they'd leave it alone. It's a slightly run-down old stone tower that's, room, that's been rumored to be haunted long before I ever showed up. There are definitely ghosts haunting this place. If ghosts haunt anywhere, it's a place where elithids have lived and fed. Disagree. I think in general, there's the tie between the psychic and the spiritual. And I think if VJ is eating them, there ain't no fucking ghost. They're just consuming the soul. We should have talked about that in the talk part. If that's what they're doing, Dylan. <laughs> we should have talked about that a little bit more. Makes them a very different creature. I think that is a debatable choice, depending on how much you want to lean into psionics. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> and I would say that if you eat the soul, the person has to still be there. So if the, if, if the illithid eats the soul of a person, if they actually consume them, then it's like rogue from the X-Men. They're always in there. Their mind, their abilities and their skills and their powers are all in there. But they're in there, too, and they can sometimes bubble up and take control. Eh, digestion. <laughs> digestion. <laughs> not a Sarlacc pit. Maybe. I don't disagree with that. That's actually pretty cool. Well, maybe it is. Maybe it is. Maybe, like, you're in there for a while, but eventually it just consumes you. However, until they get hungry again. It just keeps <laughs> getting worse. Right? <laughs> it's a bit of a large stone tower, like, large enough to, which you might typically associate with, large enough, large and want large and round enough to have a hallway leading out and leading into a number of other doors. Like the room you were in was circular in its and the way it was shaped, like it was yeah. um, a half circle. Mm -hmm. And you're in this long, darkened hallway. There isn't any lights. I mean, as you know, why would a mind player need that? Um, right. A number of doors, a lot of them rotting wood, some hanging slightly off of their hinges. Uh, one in particular that actually has kind of like a um, strange purple glow coming from underneath it. Okay. Well, that's probably where he is. <laughs> okay. So I would inch along the wall 
with my sword at the ready and just get to that door and listen again. Does he hear anything? Bad trance. <laughs> you hear a kind of mm, thrumming sound. That sounds evil and uplithity, yeah. But not familiar to you. As a, a gif of really any stripe, you're mildly psionically attuned. This is something that your species was fully immersed in. Smells wrong is the best way to humanize the sense you get. Sword in one hand, hand on the... T- is, there a, is there a door handle? Is the, I'm assuming it's a door. Is there a door yes, handle? Yes, okay. there is a door handle. I'm going in. As you push open this door, you are washed with this purple light that was coming from underneath the floor, from underneath the uh, door itself. And for a moment, it's bright and blinding, and then your eyes readjust to that after being in pitch darkness. And you see kind of like a, a sort of a strange, like chrysalis chamber, and inside there is. Now, you've encountered a lot of different creatures that have been touched by mind flares, Um, even have heard whispers of an elder brain dragon itself, have seen a mind witness, have seen these like, have fought against an intellect devour. Fucking hate those things. Fighting against them isn't even that hard. You can pretty much just punt them, but Jesus fuck, (laughs) dealing with them, getting into a headspace where you're willing to punt it, whole task. I couldn't sleep for a week. (laughs) So you're used to mind flare experimentations, but you've only ever seen the finished product, save for like the Ceramorphosis part, because uh, it actually like turning into an actual mind flare versus turning, you know, them into these lesser entities compared to the mind flare. What you're seeing in front of you is some type of there is like a humanoid figure inside of this, inside of this chrysalis, a gemstone dragonborn, unsure of what type the the purple light and the whatever liquid they're kind of floating in, obscuring that. But you can see like the gems poking off of the body and can make that inference. Part of the face already has like the the stereotypical mind flare tentacle features but the other half is still their own dragon born so part tentacle part with the long dragon like snout that comes out and also um some strange like long tentacles coming out of their back that remind you of the um mind witness you might have witnessed you may have seen in uh, previous times and the mind just... witness that i witnessed yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> And just these strange ruin runes carved on their body that you can't quite make out because the liquid itself is distorting it. A kind of opaque, like almost like I'm looking through like fog. So when they're closer to the glass, I can make out bits of it, but everything else just fades into this thick purplish liquid. Roll me Arcana. Eight plus zero is eight. You know enough to recognize those runes as Dwarven. Dwarven. Dwarven runes carved into the body of a gemstone half-born dragon who's half a lithid. Don't like any of this, but I'm the smashy kind not the science we got we have scientists we got plenty of scientists mm-hmm. right i'm the smashy kind not the investigative kind despite that i need a little more information so i'm going to circle this thing and try and figure out anything i can about it roll me investigation then i wrote a natural one one plus five <laughs> is six. Oh boy. You managed to find notebooks, uh, little like scrawled sort of calculations. But it's, but it's if I found those things. Like I know what they are, but I have no comprehension of them. You, Yeah, you recognize what they are. 
you don't speak deep speech. So like you can read the calculations because they're they're numbers, it's math. But without any context, it's it's math. Alright, they go in the bag. Give them I'll give them to the eggheads. As you shove this into your bag, the, the creature that's just been in here at this point has been like moving a little bit as a creature might in liquid, but not really. And then eyes like fly open, panic, just staring at you like and then you hear a voice in your head. You found something I've liked playing with. And I would like lean in, look at this thing, to tap the glass. The voice isn't coming from it. The voice is coming through it. Is that kind of the feeling I'm getting? It's a relay. <sighs> Crack my shoulders. Obviously, I have been found. And I'd look right at this thing. This is one of your inventions is it very observant of you he would lean very close to the glass and look this thing directly in its malformed eye i know that you think i am trapped in here with you but you my friend are trapped in here with me and then just smash the glass There's a moment where that psionic control, where that mind flare, the little bit of almost hind brain left in the dragonborn seems to take over at a fist flying towards it. And you see the eyes widen and the mouth opens and there's an inhale. And immediately you watch this thing start to drown. You smash the glass, it falls. And like it's halfway through Ceramorphosis, it is drowning and it just panics scrabbling on broken glass and loose liquid just trying to get to its feet trying to claw its way up your leg just trying to get help form sword end it the hand got up to your hip and just slides down your leg limp okay see it's always personal but now it's a little bit more personal. I hate this particular mind flare just a little bit more. And he wipes the blood off his stolen psionic blade and he turns to go stalk this thing. It knows where I am now. There's no reason to sneak around. I'm just gonna go find this fight. We're basically gonna let you roll survival to try to hunt this thing through the halls. It has additional floors. Like you go to the end of the hall, it's got the stairwell, but also the wood is rotten. So there's holes and stuff in it. And um, I think at one point as you're like stalking towards the door that leads up, that the stairwell leads up, there's actually a pretty like, there's like a hole. Like I, I'm imagining there's probably like three additional floors besides the regular one. And there's a hole that seems to go all the way up at the top. And like yeah. there's a, there's like a brief moment where you feel like, like, you know, when people describe how they felt before elect like a lightning strike hit them and you feel that. And I would ask you to make a dexterity saving throw. Plus seven on my deck saves. 13 plus seven is 20. You do pass, but nine points of lightning damage. What does it look like? Um, yeah, so it is a purple streak of lightning. Like, just yeah, <sighs> force lightning. Yep, exactly. It's the evil lightning. You dodge it. You sprawl back. It's on the stairs, so there's a little bit of a, like, not quite a fall, but a stumble. Yeah. As some of the stairs, like, are eradicated. And you look down, looking back up at you. First one, then another, then another. Four little purple glowing heads as a set of cranium rats look up at you from the bottom floor. Mm hmm cock their little heads when you say bottom floor how far down maybe 10 feet like the floor below you great i'm a monk i jump sword down there is just the fleeting thought of that was rude and then one of them is skewered <laughs> Shook. immediately three rats in just three separate directions 
dash off their little glowing brain pods. I raise my other arm, summoning a crossbow in it as I do, and by the time it's leveled, I can pull the trigger. Attack roll. Eight plus, sorry, 18 plus eight is 26. An arrow materializes already drawn in the crossbow and fires. It passes through the rat, fully skewering it, and then vanishes. Just a a figment of psionic energy. And that same psychic voice, now a little bit, well, considerably clumsier, goes, Not friend. (laughs) Heart lots. Bonus action reload. The other two are rats in the bottom floor of a decrepit old tower. They scurry off. They are gone. Enough of your games, creature. Face me. Come find me. I think you'll be delicious. (laughs) You hear the sound in your head. (laughs) It's it's like, oh, it's the worst thing to hear in your head. Like, it's bad enough to hear that shit, but to have it, like, just right behind the back (laughs) of your neck, like, oh. Feels like your cerebellum is being licked. Gross, by the way. Fuck you. God, you're so... (laughs) That's the worst thing you've ever said. I am running at full monk speed, 50 feet per round, just sprinting up these stairs. You just pound up the stairs. There's the occasional snap, and you just, without hesitation, get your next foot on the stair before you can start to fall. It is a rapid sprint. You make it to the top. I just hit that door. I don't even open. I just slam a shoulder into it and throw it open. BJ, top floor. Appears to be old furniture covered in cloth. That's creepy already. You don't see anybody in here. You do hear the voice in your head again. Oh, you think this is where I am? Or maybe somewhere else? As I'm listening to you, I'm walking around, right? And I'm just ripping off a cloth from like an old clock or a chaise lounge, right? No matter how many times I've faced these creatures, you keep expecting them to be the same. If you deal with one mind flayer in a tower, you've dealt with them all. They're in the same room. They have it set up the same. They've done it the same, but it's never the same. In these creatures that you expect to be uniform, there's always this individuality that creeps out. And it's always so unsettling to see it. So I fully expected them to be at the top of the tower, everything set up, big, you know, big telescope or whatever, right? But there's nothing here but old furniture that clearly never belonged to them. Let me see if I have any other tricks then. I think at this point, it's gotten scary enough that they're gonna to touch their chest and cast mage armor, shimmering golden Gizari armor forms over them and then a helmet kind of clamps over the front, crack their shoulders, let the crossbow go, resummon the sword, and they're just gonna go back down and go through room by room, opening doors, methodically clearing each level. As you, like, put on the armor and pull out the sword, the voice in your head. You dare. You carry essentially one of us in your possession. Eating you is going to be fun. To begin with, this makes it so much better. I carry a trophy of your hate in order to cut off your head. So you're at the top, and then you go down to the second level. Now this, this is actually where you see the most gruesome of work. You saw uh, the, the prepping area, essentially. And then you saw a chamber that held a creature that had already been experimented on slightly and was being grown and cultivated for whatever reason. But this is the actual room where your companions would have been taken. This is where you actually find the body of the elven woman that you heard scream earlier. For one of the companions, you saw like they're a, like about a fist sized hole coming out of their skull. This one in particular has had the skull and flesh peeled back the way you would peel off an orange, but kind of looking um, like peeled off like that, but in kind of a slightly artistic way. So it looks kind of like flower petals. 
It essentially looks like someone took a fine blade and carved an asterisk over just like that little almost point at the top of the skull and peeled it and back. just peeled it back. Upsetting. <laughs> you can see a number of already appears to be dead mind flare larvae like the they kind of they look kind of rotted at this point um moving slightly but in more so of a, like a sluggish undead manner than actually what they than the live one appeared in that was in the half orc's head i'm gonna pull out that jar and i'm gonna hold the jar close to those other mind flare slugs does anything happen it's a natural aversion. It tries to keep away. The, but the other weird slugs aren't trying to keep away from each other. When you saw the other one moving, it moved like an animal. It was feeding. It was not not quite meticulous. There's, there's a stage in the Ceramorphosis where they really seem to gain intelligence, sapience. But it was still, like, coherent. These are just moving, consuming. What if this is not meant to host them? This is just meant to feed them. Like, this is just like where they're first placed. At, okay, well. Roll me an arcana check. Oh, um, dear. Okay. Please roll well. I want to tell you. I got a 17 plus zero. So it's about as well as I can do. <laughs> do you want to tell them? You're actually, I would, I would imagine um, you're familiar with all types of, like, the, the, the different types of mind flayers that can exist. For the most part, yeah, I, I would imagine, yeah. Including the Alhoon, the Illithyria, the, the, the mind flayer lich. I always have a hard time pronouncing it. And just, like, examining, examining the kind of deadish rotting looking ones the aversion that the living one has knowing a little bit about um mind flayers aversion to undead in the first place with that 17 it's not a long leap to think these are clearly some type of like undead versions of the actual larvae that might be like burrowing into the brain to turn this into some type of new undead um, mind flayer, not an Alhoon, not in a mind flayer lich, but something. No, something worse. You are looking at a zombie slug. That is a chilling realization, especially because I like this elf. She was great and incredibly helpful. And like most of the people I encounter, good, because very few bad people are willing to help you deal with a mind flare. Most of the people who help me are good, and most of them pay a price. Evil people are too worried about themselves too to selfish. go anywhere near a mind flare. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not worth the risk, but good people, good people will do it, and she was a good person. And I think about that and say a small prayer to her as I place my fingers on her forehead and cast Bonfire. Durusha Sinako. The only real consolation as those things die is it didn't look like it was going to take. She's probably been dead for a while. What the hell does that make a difference? It's undead. Maybe that's it working. I don't know. Bonfire. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that process... I mean, that process of seramorphosis was not taking place. Sure, the normal process, but maybe undead seramorphosis was, and I don't know what it, it could. No, it, it could that's be worse. Fair. I don't think that's. I don't think she was spared anything. I think the fire spared her. I think that was that the first reasonable. mercy she found. Uh, wow. Okay. Right on that. Oh, so he he finds his center because, I mean, he. This is what he does, but it's, it's still like it's day. upsetting. It's hard. <laughs> it's, it's always so hard, but. Every time he deals with one of these horrors, a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand are spared it. He focuses, takes a breath, 
and continues on. Actually, as you like take that moment to have that breath, the mind flares in your head. I suppose I would have needed to have disposed of it. It wasn't working. Perhaps it was the vessel that was inferior. Maybe you'll do. You have a touch of magic. And at this point, there's one floor left that you haven't actually, like, so there was the basement, there was the start, the first floor, and then um, the second and third. Well, I guess actually the the, the fourth. The th- yeah, 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 fair <laughs> and enough. And so there's yeah. the... It's in there, whatever. Yeah, the second yeah. floor that <laughs> hasn't actually... There's a bonus floor. <laughs> there's, yeah. yeah, there's a slice. Yeah, they I'm can't good. count. Yeah. <laughs> it's like that bullshit, like, in older buildings where an elevator hits a half a floor and you don't even know it was there. Oh, <laughs> oh shit, the whole other half floor. Yeah, so I get there. Before I open that door, I get to that door and I stop because this thing has talked in my head several times. So I just assume it can at will at this point. I just stop and I think because whenever I'm given a chance, I will always reach out and say, do you want like basically, do you want to talk like like creature before I destroy you and end your long life? Is there anything you have to say? There's like a long pregnant pause in your head. You know the creature is there. I doubt you're about to end me, but I'm one to strike deals and have a little fun. If you do, I'll depart. My knowledge of what I was doing here. Make sure you understand the brilliance of my plan and know others will continue it. His fingers linger on the door handle. Continue. Come and defeat me. And with that, he grabs the door handle, throws open the door, and with the same motion, casts darkness. All right. Yeah, that that goes off. Shit. Yeah. Shit. (laughs) So, So, like, the door flies open for a moment. You see the burning yellow hate in my eyes, assuming you can see where this is. I just assume you can see everything. And then a cloud of darkness rushes in 15 feet, consumes me and everything in front of me. You will fall to congeal. And this was an interesting trick, but it won't work. There's a sound you kind of hear, like more of the humming again, but that's it. So I can see in this darkness. What does this room look like? It's actually empty. There's there's just like the the top floor had used furniture. Um, the the next floor had the actual workstation, and then this floor is well, actually, it's empty for everything except for an intricately um, carved uh, sigil, large sigil in the middle of the floor. All right. Then from within the darkness, I'll summon my crossbow and fire a bolt into that sig- into that sigil. <laughs> Anything happen? No. Put the crossbow away. I will then step forward to the very edge of that darkness because it, it, it would extend 15 feet out into the room from where I cast it. So I would step to the very edge of that darkness and look down at this sigil in the floor. Roll Arcana. Oh, okay. Fair enough. It's a sigil a Right, okay, right, right, right. I rolled a seven plus zero is seven. I don't fucking know. Fuck, oh, man. <laughs> he just walks in, looks down like, oh, yeah, oh, what the fuck is this? Dude, did you, le- did you learn to read? <laughs> I know how to read. I know how to read the sign saying an illithid is here, go kill them. I don't know all the magic shit. I don't bother to learn about their... I, t- I find stuff that creeps me out and I bring it home so the scientists can figure out what it is. That's my job. Here's the bit that we can fully say now. Here's what your combined arcana of 7 plus 8, that's 15. <laughs> You're starting to get the slightest of inklings. This one might be a wizard. Fuck. <laughs> that, would, that would be what he thought. He'd look down and he'd be like, oh, fuck. Fuck, what do I have? What do I have, Lami? I got my sword, nothing else, because you took all my gear if I would have had anything. So I've got my sword, I got my crossbow, all my amulet. I got, I got I all my spells that are going to help me out here. In that moment, I would just curse and I would extend a hand and I would just start 
eldritch blasting along the walls. I'm just going to blast every edge of the walls in this room and the ceiling. If anything happens, great. If not, I'm just going to step out and just start, I'm just going to start blasting every surface until something reacts to me because something's invisible or hidden or whatever, and I'm not subtle or capable of finding it, but I can blast shit until something shakes free. Here's what I'm going to give you, VJ. I assume you're in the room, but not immediately uh, visible. Correct. I'm going to let you make the attack roll. Because you're literally trying to just destroy the room, I'll let you make a standard attack roll. Otherwise, I would have you roll with advantage. But like... That's going to be an 8 plus 7 is 15. What's the AC on a Mind Flayer? A AC on a Mind Flayer is 15 with a breastplate, because it's a sexy half breastplate. It would be a 16, but they always leave the stomach open. <laughs> You're the worst. <laughs> they do. Look, I don't look. I'm not making this up. You're Mind not. Flayers have nope. sexy half armor where they're all exposed and showing little bits off. Aram, I'm, I'm looking at it. And not yeah, this one, breast- not this particular one, okay, cool. but but it, it does like they, they they just filled it in with leather, but it is a little half breast thing. And yep. there's this is just a more conservative mind flare. Normally that shit would be open and they'd be showing off some purple abs. You can roll for your damage. You just hit. So that's going to be seven points of damage. Um, I got a 15 for constitution. Then you're good. You can maintain concentration. Oh, hold up. Aram, what level are you? I am a total 13. You actually get three die 10. Uh, Eldritch Blast is a weirdly written spell. It actually scales with your level. This spell creates more than one beam when you reach higher levels. Two beams at fifth level, three beams at 11th, four beams at 17th. It, it does okay. not scale with It's multiple Warlock beams level. though, and I'm blasting everything in the room, so there's no way I hit with more than one. Yeah, fair enough. I think at this point, the the, the Eldritch Blast hits me. I maintain the vis- invisibility, but you hear in your head, and then it drops, and you need to make an intelligence saving throw. <laughs> Fuck me. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I feel bad about this. I do feel bad about this, but I rolled a natural 20. Motherfucker! <laughs> <laughs> you, you bad. I, I feel really bad about this one. Like it hurts a little bit. I'm not gonna lie. You are not uh, an intelligent man. A dumb man. Or, sorry, sorry. You you used sorry. You used she her. Yeah. No, I I just caught myself. Wait. You are not typically an intelligent woman. Thank you. You you are not particularly learned. Your f- strengths are sword base. Yeah. Mostly. You know what I am? You know what I am? I'm just smart enough to know how smart I am. Yeah. That's what I am. But you also have been doing this for long enough to know how to steal yourself, to turn your mind into a trap and just push back enough that it can't quite obliterate you in a single go. VJ, what's the half damage on that? That is going to be 12 points of damage. 12 <sighs> points of Jesus. psychic damage. Oh, what is that? What does that feel like, dude? What does that feel like when that hits me? You remember that feeling you had in the back of your head as if I licked your cerebellum? It's, yeah, unfortunately, yes, I do. It's that, but way more intense. I'm not licking it at this oh. point. It's like that, that you know, the teeth that mind players have underneath their, their tentacles. The Yeah. I've always assumed beak, personally, because that's what squids have. But It's like when venom is on the back of your neck, right? Yeah. Just kind of hanging out. Yeah. Just yeah. biting oh. into that. Okay, super gross. That's upsetting. But you shake it off relatively well. It doesn't crush me. No. But it's still like, this is a powerful creature. And it's a reminder how, how powerful they are. Imagine, you know when people describe something as washing over you? Right, right. It isn't that. It slams into you. It passes through you and it pushes the entire way. Is my turn? Um, I believe so. Okay, now when I blast, when I, when I caught them, did I did I know I hit them? Is would be my question. To do that action, that attack, it was a standard invisibility. They are visible now. Okay, got mm-hmm. you. Then I just leap forward without hesitation, flurry of blows. Okay. 
Do your and my sword is my Kensai weapon, so I shall be using it. So you, I just go into fight mode, both hands on it, leap forward a good 10 feet, and just come at you with all the rage in hell. And hopefully this is actually you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> spend my, I'm gonna spend my key point. I pull this glowing milky white blade that you would instantly recognize as one of the son, as as one of the psychic weapons your people make. Like I clearly took this off one of your brethren, and I'm gonna swing at you four times. First one, two plus eight is ten. That's gonna be a miss. Second one. Uh, natural 20 plus 8 is going to hit. Third one, 10 plus 8 is 18 is going to hit. Uh, Fourth shield. one. 18 not going to help. Sorry. Nice. All right. And then the last one is 13 plus 8 is 21. Just beats my shield. Okay. All right. So here's how I picture it. I come in, but you're faster than I expected, and I swing wildly. I use that momentum, though, to come back around and slam that blade deep into your side. I pull it back out in a second, but your shield is up, and I bounce off it. Seeing that, though, I'm so well-trained, I go for the legs, and I cut down under it and slice at your thigh. And this is all in, like, six seconds. Roll me your damage. So the three die 10 total is going to be 18 plus six is 24 points of damage. While I'm striking you, I'm spending a key point. The very last sword strike, right? You feel like this wave of invisible force slam into your, into your body. And I need you to make a constitution save. Uh, 20, 19 plus one. You feel the wind get knocked out of you, but you're not stunned. And now it's my turn. Yeah. (laughs) Unfortunately, yeah. Not multiple versions, but like different, like shadowy versions of him, like pull out of the body before pulling back in. (sighs) And you now have disadvantage on all of your attacks against me. Right. Okay, you son of a bitch. (laughs) (laughs) Gotta stay alive long enough to do something. I get it. Uh, did you roll your D6, PJ? Gotta see if that Mind Blast recharges. Oh, that's right, that's right, that's right. I'm gonna keep that knowledge to myself. You'll find out <laughs> next round. You got a good poker face, PJ. <laughs> you got a really good poker face. All right, I've got a decision to make now, then. It's still your turn, or is it my turn? It's it's your it's your turn now. Yeah, I did them. Mind Flayer, even with the Arcanist, doesn't have bonus actions. Unfortunately. I'm facing down this shifting form of mass I go to steady my blade and you can see me coming in for a, you know for another round of attacks and then a smirk on my face as I let go with one hand and open my palm and cast shatter you have advantage on this save on shatter uh, mind players have magic resistance advantage yes. on saving throws against spells and other magic effects I should know that Ooh, and dexterity save constitution save 15 Meet it to beat it. Sucks to suck. Yep. All right. So you only take half. I never roll this well when I'm doing it in my own games. <laughs> I love that I'm, <laughs> yeah, well, I'm doing it here. You have to let your players live, you know? <laughs> this player. You rolled that at a good time because I rolled an eight, a six, and a six for 20 points of damage, halved for 10. The windows at the back of the room just shatter. This is explosion all behind you as your whole amorphous form kind of blows out and sucks back in. <laughs> oh, wait, I got to make a hold on. OK, yeah, I rolled a 12 for my constitution saving throw. You're good. Um, I need you to make another intelligence saving throw, Aram. Oh, boy. OK, intelligence saving throw. That is going to be a plus zero. Come on, come on, come on. Ten. Fuck yes. God, I you love it when you're sad. Up. All right, let's let's do this. Let's do this. So first, oh, look how excited! I wish you all could see how excited VJ is to roll these dice. <laughs> Not a great roll. It's ten points of psychic damage, but you're stunned for a minute. That is un- for a for, minute. For oh, a minute, when, as I use my mind blast, and you feel that feeling again, but it's worse. It's so much worse. This is okay. I want to just highlight one thing here. 
This is why some of these monsters, like a vampire, like this creature, it doesn't matter how scaled up I am. One thing goes wrong, and it's a party wipe because I'm only one person. So here's the question, Rom. Uh, technically, you have a second save because you get to repeat the save at the end of your turns. Yes. I would like you to roll it so we know, but then just production and this is going to run long. Do we want to just let her slide regardless? Okay. Here's what I think would happen narratively. If I make this roll and you've come in for the kill, you got close enough to me that I'm able to turn it around on you. But if I fail the roll, that's it. I'm please, dead. Please, 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 please. I'm down with that. Do I we agree all agree to those? Do we all agree to, I those, agree to terms? those terms? All right. Come on. So, actually, the roll is intelligence. So it's a DC 15, and I'm rolling a flat, flat D20. D20. Uh, right? Never mind. Yeah, just roll that. You ready? Come on. It's a 19, and I can show it to you. It's a 19. Damn it. Oh, no. Like, you see the light go out of my eyes. You know that you have me. I imagine you step out of this black amorph. What do you look like when I finally see you? I do have the breast breastplate on, but in such a way that it's, like, kind of fused into my wizardly robes. Lots of deep purples that actually ac accentuate my own purple skin. Like, I put a lot of thought into how I look. Like, I obviously had somebody do my bidding to go buy me these things and get this custom made. And just, like pristine, glowing, slimy skin, well-fed at this point. Like, I don't miss meals. I might eat three times a day. <laughs> <laughs> I walk forward slowly, and in your head you hear me gloating. I guess I will not be sharing with you, and you will not be taking my notes back with you, but I'm sure you're going to be delicious. And I wish my brother and brother so upset with my experimenting. I could let them know I ended you. Alas. And I begin the process of burrowing into your head and skull, ripping it open. As those tentacles close around the top of my head, I fall back into my training, back into my focus, shut out the pain, shut out the horror and plant my fist directly beneath my chin and summon my sword. With your mouth open, you expect that sweet, the, f the flesh, it's always so soft, like a fine mousse, a pate even. <laughs> then there's a rigidity, <laughs> just dead solid. Your mouth is torn open. There's a sharp stinging sensation. And then immediately, neither of you feels a goddamn thing. Thank you for joining us for a DM deep dive into the Mind Flayer. For more information about us, notes for each episode, and ways you can help support the show, head over to killeverymonster.com. If any of the ideas we've discussed on the show have sparked some of your own, tell us about it on Twitter at KEM Podcast. You'll find me at DJ Malenfant and Aram at Aram Vardian. For ad-free episodes, early releases, bonus episodes, print-ready maps, our new audio DMs notes, and my character sheets for each encounter, head over to patreon.com slash killeverymonster. You can also listen to ad-free episodes and bonus content by subscribing to the show on Apple Podcasts. Our intro theme and many of the sound effects you hear in the show were created by BattleBards. Check them out at BattleBards.com. This episode was produced by Aram Vartian and Dylan Malenfant. I also did the editing. We were joined by VJ Harris. You can find them on Twitter at VJH Creations. And if you are anything like me and all of that information just fell right out of your head, you'll find everything you need at killeverymonster.com. And we'll see you next time for, for Kill, Kill Every, Every Monster. Monster.
Hey, it's Mae Whitman, and I play Frankie in the new Realm podcast, The Sisters. The Sisters is about a museum curator of medical oddities who investigates the origins of a mutated skeleton with two layers of bones. Seven ribs are completely fused. And you have no idea where this came from? No. She was sent here anonymously. Uh Uh-uh. Not she. They, maybe? Wait. I've never seen anything like this. Soon, she uncovers an extraordinary mystery that connects her present with one family's tragic past in hauntingly dangerous ways. My grandfather was a journalist back in the 60s and 70s. He specialized in strange stories. Who are they? How are they connected to the skeleton? Play the tape. You'll see. Listen to The Sisters wherever you get your podcasts. We dream about it. We both dream about it. How often? Every night. This show was produced and edited by Dead Ghost Productions. Find out more about us and all the shows we make at deadghostpro.com.